AI in fintech is utilizing data and specialized hardware and algorithms, machine learning algorithms, to augment humans and allow people to utilize this technology to do things that they never imagined that they could do before in fintech. What are the tasks that are being automated and augmented? They're these, these nine, market research, accounting, assistance, investment, credit, insurance, collections, predictive analytics, and compliance. So I'll give you some examples of each one of these, and then we'll look at some 2017 results in machine learning and AI. We'll talk about new applications of machine learning and AI in a variety of different areas that you might want to invest in outside of fintech, and then what some of the ethical implications are. So in market research, there are companies like Data Miner that are not originally focused on fintech. They vacuum up vast amounts of information and allow people who subscribe to certain vectors of information, like finance or in weather or in medicine, to get specialized information just for them that's pulled out of that massive database. And then we have companies like AlphaSense that are specialized in fintech and allow financial analysts to ask questions they've never asked before to make it easier to ask those questions and to get answers, not just references like you would on Google. In accounting, there are companies like AppZen that do auditing of expense reports. Now, this is a horrible task. It tends to be very tedious. People have to look for needles in a haystack. And what we're doing now is using machine learning to identify the needles. Then humans can look at that stack of needles and decide where can we make an exception and where do we have some evidence of fraud. And then there are companies like Zeitgold that are producing AI-fueled accounting systems on the cloud and on smartphones directly so that professionals and small businesses can run their entire operation right on their own smartphone. In assistance, we have companies like Casisto that have Kai Banking, which is a consumer-facing personal banker that allows people to do almost anything that they would do with a personal banker directly on their smartphone. Now, Amazon's Alexa is not specialized in finance, but it has a 70% market share. And look at the growth of skills here. In Q1 2016, 135 skills. In Q1 2017, over 10,000 skills. Now many of them financial. For example, ask Capital One to make a credit card payment. Get the rate for a credit card from Virginia Credit Union. Ask Ameritrade for a market update. Ask Fidelity to get a quote for Amazon. Ask Liberty Mutual for auto insurance estimates. These are all vocally enabled searches, something that was very difficult to do five years ago. And here is a company called Digit that addresses a problem that is often associated with millennials, but a lot of people have this problem. They have difficulty saving. And what this system does is do, it does a forecast of the cash flow in, a, say, a student's bank account, uh, in their checking account, and every so often will make an incremental transfer into their savings account. Of course, it can be reversed if they want to do that. But this is a machine learning-fueled app that allows people to save with a little help from AI. And here's investment. Numerai is a hedge fund that is a crowdsourced hedge fund with billions of individual predictions and hundreds of thousands of models. And they reward their crowdsourced partners not for getting the best model, because they're not looking for the best model, they're looking for a model that contributes to their synthetic model in their hedge fund, and they pay their partners in Bitcoin. 
This company, Sentient, came out of uh, part of the team that built Siri. Uh, and this team has put together a evolutionary platform that builds little agents that are hedge fund managers and make predictions. And they evolve them. They compete them against each other. They take the top of the class, and they go again and again and again until they finally end up with very, very sophisticated hedge fund managers. Credit is another big area for fintech. A firm from Max Levchin is a company that is all about transparency and honesty in financial transactions. They're trying to transform the landscape, particularly for young people. This company, Zest Finance, is focused on those people who have a thin file. That is, there's not a lot of financial data about them, and they want to enable those people to be checked out, and for those people who are worthy of getting a loan, they can get a loan even without a lot of credit history. Insurance is another area that is being disrupted. You're going to hear later on today about Lemonade. It's all about using machine learning in every aspect of the underwriting process, of the sales process, of interacting with customers. This is a B Corp. They take 20% of their premium. Uh, they get a 20% fee on premiums. And for people who underclaim, that underclaimed money goes to their favorite charity. So they're doing some good in the world as well as transforming the industry. Cape Analytics is using satellite data and as well as other data to validate the claims that people make for insurance on their properties. So they can find out what kind of roof you actually have and what condition it's in. They can look at the square footage of your property and check out the square footage directly. Collections are another big area. Collect AI is all about emulating collection agents, including their tone of voice. So they want to learn incrementally what works for getting collections in the door, and they get better and better as time goes on. True Accord takes a somewhat different approach to collections. They recognize that sometimes collection problems are the result of either misunderstandings or uh, sometimes uh, lack of clarity and sometimes deliberate falsification of who owes what to whom. So they look at both sides of the equation, and they try to come to a true accord of what's owed and what isn't. And then they get very high compliance once they get agreement about that. Predictive analytics is another key area. This company, Opera, is doing amazing work with signals. They have a signal hub. And they have descriptive signals that are pattern recognized from the world. And then they take those signals and they use them in prediction. So they have predictive signals that are all about conditions of the market, conditions of the world that can be acted on. So they're looking for proactively set up predictions on actionable information. Kensho is a company that has one of the world's largest global event databases. And they have knowledge graphs associated with their event database. And they are enabling people who are interested in events in the world to make ever more interesting and precise forecasts about what those events mean. And in compliance, we have Trifecta. Trifecta came out of a project between Stanford, UC Berkeley, and University of Washington. It was called Data Wrangler. It was all about marshalling the data and cleaning it and getting out the noise, a key task in machine learning. And Trifecta is all about enabling data marshalling and data cleaning for further analysis. This company, Digital Reasoning, 
came out of the military and intelligence analysis world. They're in Franklin, Tennessee. A large percentage of them, about 30% of them, have top secret clearances, but they're now focusing on the financial world. And they, in particular, are able to look at communications inside a company, like email and other kinds of communications, and look for signs of fraud. So the question is, what is AI that is powering all this innovation? Well, it's pattern recognition techniques like deep learning and other machine learning techniques that allow us to make inferences from vast quantities of data. It's software agents that may combine a pattern recognition technique like deep learning with reinforcement learning that reinforces an agent for a high score in an arbitrary task, like a game or a prediction. It's a vision of superhuman intelligence that really hasn't happened yet, but movies and science fiction like to blur that line. It's important for you to keep your critical thinking skills intact around that. And it's computer science that's accelerating all of the other exponential technologies like synthetic biology, nanotechnology, robotics, and yes, even AI. People sometimes ask about the relationship between deep learning and machine learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of AI. AI is a subset of computer science. Now, even with these definitions, people sometimes get confused. True story, I was recently on a flight from Seattle to San Francisco. The guy next to me is wearing a cowboy hat. He says, Neil, wh what do you do in real life? I said, well, I'm, I'm in the AI business. He said, really? I am too. How many head do you have? And I thought, what is he talking? Oh, he means artificial insemination. So there is a relationship. Uh, you can use AI to select the genes of your beef or dairy cattle. Here are 100 startups that are using AI and machine learning to transform industries. And the thing to get about this is, yes, we're using machine learning all across fintech. But look at these other areas. These are the companies that, that hedge funds invest in outside of the fintech arena. Companies that are auto companies, robotics companies, cybersecurity companies, sales companies, healthcare companies, commerce, internet of things, business intelligence. Across the board, AI and machine learning are disrupting the landscape. So deep learning is a hierarchical pattern recognition algorithm. What's changed since 2009 is that we can now have deep stacks of these recognition layers because we can preserve coherence in between the different layers of the stacks. And let me show you how this works. Yeah. So if we start with a set of pixels, images, we can recognize in the first stage of the hierarchy just edges, vertical line, horizontal line, diagonal line. Second stage, object parts, ears, nose, eyes, chins. Third stage, objects like faces. But three layers are not enough to, to differentiate all of your beautiful faces. We need more layers for that. Microsoft has a pattern recognition hierarchy with 152 later, layers. You don't need anywhere near that to achieve good facial pattern recognition. Look at the money that's now going into AI. In 2012, 589 million. 2016, $5 billion. And we're seeing major changes in hardware, hardware that's specialized for machine learning and AI. This is a tensor processing unit board uh, this system is blistering fast. It just was announced by Alphabet. It is specialized for running machine learning algorithms like TensorFlow that Amin mentioned. This system allows you to train and test on the same board, which was not the case with their first version of this. And this system has 180 teraflops, 180 times 10 to the 12th logical operations per second. It is blistering fast. And it can be woven into a larger fabric of computing. If you see all these blue, these two blue racks together, those two blue racks are 11.5 petaflops, 10 to the 15th 
logical operations per second, or about a human equivalent worth of computing power, not human intelligence, but just raw computing power. I'm encouraging you to try AI and machine learning at home. You can download the R machine learning library uh, right onto your laptop. If you don't have the chops to use it yourself, you can invite a high school student to help you. R has 1,800 free extensions, and it itself is free. TensorFlow is free for researchers. It's vastly powerful. It allows you to represent your problem as a set of algorithms in the node of a data flow graph, and the edges that connect those nodes are multi-dimensional data arrays. So then you can spread your problem across a broad array of computer fabrics. What's happening now is an emerging synthesis of human intelligence and machine intelligence. All of you have heard about the recent win of AlphaGo in China and in Korea a year before that. Just for context, if you think about chess, it has an average number of moves per turn, alternative moves, of about 35. And 35 after that, 35 after that, it fans out very quickly. Go has an average number of alternative moves per turn of 200. It is epically complex. And just a few weeks ago, Alphabet's AlphaGo player won against Ki Jai, the world champion in Go, Chinese gentleman. And he was amazingly graceful and played games with uh, machine learning algorithms after a set of matches that he lost. These are results that would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. Let's look at Libratus, which was developed by Tomas Sanholm and Norm Brown at CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. This is a system that plays no limit Texas Hold'em poker. It played 120,000 hands, just to make sure there was no um, fluke results against four world champions in poker. And it won $1.77 million in poker chips. An amazing result. Why should we care? because this system can deal with bluffing and misinformation and strategy. You may see this as a quiz. What's happening in the right cell of this matrix? This is the Raven Progressive Matrices test. Uh, it is a test of analogical and visual reasoning. Uh, the right answer is D and because it matches the symmetry of the column and uh, the row. Ken Forbes from Northwestern has developed a system called CogSketch that outperforms the average American on this test. It's in the 70th percentile of test takers. IBM beat the two world champions in Jeopardy way back in ancient history, 2011. But now, IBM is moving Watson into virtually every area of human endeavor, including financial services. The background on the AlphaGo player uh, was uh, a system called the Atari Game Player, developed by DeepMind in the UK. They gave a demo in 2013 of a powerful pattern recognizer, a convolutional neural network that was combined with reinforcement learning, which just means a powerful way of reinforcing an agent for a high score in the game. It starts out with zero knowledge of a bunch of Atari games. Watch this. This is Demis Hassabis, CEO of DeepMind. And this Atari game player is playing breakout and just missed a ball. It'll miss more, another one. After 120 minutes of play, it's playing at a mediocre human level. And then, after 240 minutes of play, it's going to tunnel up the left-hand side of the screen and play from the back court where the game has no defenses. Look at the score. Pretty amazing. People sometimes describe AI as a game-changing technology. It's more than that. AI is disrupting the entire playing field that we are operating on. It's not just metaphorical. 
If you don't have bench strength in AI, you can put up prize money and your data and your problem and get two or 300 of the world's best data scientists to bid on the solution to your problem. If you don't want to put your data out in public, no problem. By the way, Kaggle just got bought. The, the place where they're doing machine learning competitions just got bought by Google Cloud this year. An alternative to that, you don't have to put your data out, would be Expertify.com. They allow you to just put out your problem, have very well qualified and curated data scientists and AI people bid on the solution to your problem. And it's been very successful. In the spirit of full disclosure, I'm an investor here. There are three problems that I want to call your attention to with AI. I'm going to have to go over them pretty quickly. One is lack of transparency, AI and machine learning tend to be like a black box, particularly machine learning. But there's a program at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency called XAI at DARPA, run by Dave Gunning. And it's all about opening up the black box of machine learning so that we get good explanations. So instead of an explanation here, like this is a cat, it tells you why it thinks it has a cat in that image. Another problem is that if you train a machine learning system like deep learning on one task, task A, and then you train it on task B, it can sometimes undergo catastrophic forgetting of how to do task A. And uh, some folks at DeepMind in the UK uh, came up with a new method of dealing with this um, called elastic weight consolidation. This is something that nature figured out with mammalian cortex. And what they're doing is preserving the knowledge of how to solve the prior task by providing a penalty for forgetting uh, the first task. So uh, they're getting very good results with that. And it's not just two steps. You can do n steps. I consider that a real breakthrough in machine learning, although it was never labeled as such by them. And then your mileage can vary. Um, in 2016, Unanimous used human intelligence and machine intelligence to correctly predict the winner of the Kentucky Derby. 2017, they didn't get it right. So again, keep your critical thinking skills intact. AI has been sponsored by companies all over the world. I added NVIDIA, Amazon, uh, Uber, and Salesforce to this list. They're all doing amazing work in AI research and development. Amazon has 1,000 people on their Alexa team. I did a study of 360 innovative applications of AI. It's not just better, faster, cheaper. It's different. AI allows us to expand the range of the possible. And you can work in any of these areas. I've seen great applications in design, diagnosis, manufacturing and management, customer service, sales and configuration, and quality. Here's an example of AI in medicine from Imperial College London. This system predicts the one-year survival rate of people with pulmonary hypertension and no robotic sleeve. And uh, cardiologists tend to be 60% accurate with that. This system is 80% accurate. If you're interested in AI and the law, this company called introspection will look at emails sent to your company like, I'm going to sue your pants off, and try to differentiate the cranks from the people who really will sue you. And if you want to use uh, AI in materials development, you can insert a problem solver, an AI solver, in between a high throughput experiment and people and get the best of human intelligence and machine intelligence to do rapid experimentation. This was the winning paper called Phase Mapper at the Innovative Applications of AI Conference in 2017. GE has a fabric that, that you can lay over a dumb factory to make it smart, more predictive, more responsive, more connected. And Carnegie Learning has systems that can model the user and provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring for people who want to learn new areas. AI is going to impact human resources, augmenting people and adding machines, transforming business models like that radically altered model that I showed you of a soccer field. But that means that we are going to have to act proactively. I think it means that we're going to have to consider various basic income experiments and free education. 
The adult conversation is that AI comes with trade-offs. Yes, faster, cheaper, better, different problem solving, but also job disruption and human identity change and risk amplification. What it means to team with AI strengths is that you get best-in-class performance for some tasks, you get improvements in speed and prediction, no vacations or sick leave, no whining, but limited empathy, language understanding, and social grace. Trust is going to be a big issue going forward. There have been a number of conferences sponsored by Future of AI, one in Puerto Rico where we talked about validity, verification, security, and control as methods to ensure that we have beneficial use of AI. There was a January 2017 conference that came up with 23 Asilomar principles for the beneficial use of AI. Elon Musk and uh, Sam Altman at Y Combinator have created OpenAI uh, to democratize access to AI and provide both software and reports to make sure that people can have access and use it safely. There's a partnership in AI now with Amazon, DeepMind, Google, Facebook, IBM, and Microsoft that's all about ensuring beneficial use of AI. Here's some operational recommendations. If you have small amounts of capital, you can innovate. Large amounts of capital, you can acquire and integrate. You can use free algorithms or sophisticated platforms. There's lots of hardware available, including very tiny hardware for the companies that you might invest in that are doing Internet of Things. For data, you can marshal the data that's available to you, not just big data, but relevant data. For talent, you can crowdsource your data if you don't have deep bench strength. For applications, innovate on product services and internal operations. And with regard to responsibility, consider security, empathy, ethics, policy, and liability. I'm encouraging you all to build an application-oriented AI toolbox for your organization. It will pay off. Here's what you can do with it. You can disrupt the financial playing field with AI. You can augment and automate white collar jobs. You can build that toolbox for application problem solving. You can become an exponential organization. Salim Ismail will be talking to you more about that later on in the summit. And the most important thing is to, to design for a world that you actually want to live in if you don't know what part of the game board you're on. We're encouraging you to build the future boldly and to do it responsibly. Thank you very much.